Great. Well, let's let's go ahead and start. Uh, a few students here. There probably come, a few more students will join us as we um, as we continue the session. So, um, everyone, uh, welcome to the session today. Uh, my name is Ben Lawrence. I'm the Ziza Sheen Professor of Franchising Entrepreneurship in the Cecil B. Day School of Hospitality in the Robinson College of Business at Georgia State University. I got a long, <laughs> a long title, but um, we're really honored today to have Gusto here. Mr. Nate uh, Hibbel is the founder of Gusto, a chain of healthy, fast, casual restaurants in Metro Atlanta. Mr. Hibble was formerly a collegiate quarterback at the University of Oklahoma, Go Sooners, and played in the NFL for the Cleveland Browns and Jacksonville Jaguars. In 2014, he opened his first Gusto and has grown the brand to include eight outlets, uh, as well as a few currently uh, under um, development, one in downtown uh, at the GSU campus. So Nate, thanks so much for sharing your entrepreneurial journey with us today. We're really excited to engage with you now and in the future. Um, so let's just start off with uh, the title of your conversation today, um, Shake Yourself Awake. How do these words reflect kind of your journey, your brand, um, and um, you know, your experiences with, um, with Gusto? First off, thanks for having me. Uh, Shake Yourself Awake is from a, a, a famous Dale Carnegie quote. Um, and I can get more into that, but for me, it was about a complete life pivot. Um, 2009, 10, I was coming out of a, I was coming out of a divorce, recession, short sale of a home, had no idea where I was going in life. People like to talk about my history in football, but uh, it was a complete, uh, reset for me in life. So, um, somewhere in there, I found out that, that I wasn't ever going to sit behind a desk and have a regular job and that I was going to chase my own dreams. And I had no idea I'd end up in the restaurant business. Um, and now 10 years later, eight years later, I'm looking back on, wow, I still can't believe I'm in the restaurant business, but, um, uh, as somebody who ate, healthier food frequently, um, I, I just, I couldn't shake the idea of why isn't there something more? Why, why, why is there, why do I have to go to Willie's three times a week and get the same thing? There's gotta be more, there's gotta be better options. And, you know, the, the sweet greens, the Cava's, the chops, the, the, those brands were not in Atlanta in 2014. They're all here now. So competition has changed, but Ben, the honest answer is, dude, I just set out to invent what I wanted as a consumer. And that's freaking nuts. Um, and it took me four years behind closed doors because I didn't know anything about food and, and, or business, frankly. Um, and I certainly didn't know the restaurant business. Um, so it was a journey of trial and error on food. Shake Yourself Awake was all about self-discovery for me. I became I was so curious about ingredients and being from a small town in South Georgia, 3000 people, uh, Hazelhurst, Georgia, if anybody knows those parts, um, it's down by Douglas, <coughs> excuse me, by Delia, Alma, you know, small town USA, people use the word food deserts, but you know, fruits and vegetables come out of a can and pick it from pig wiggly, you know, growing up. Mm -hmm. And there's a reason why you're scared, you know, some of us are scared of garlic and ginger and, and curry and, and mangoes and, and what's a chipotle pepper. And um, America is kind of coming to life. It's, it's moving toward, um, you know, we don't, we don't really have food. We don't really have like food heritage, like some of these countries in the world. So we're moving toward spicy. We're moving toward um, sour. We're moving toward fun ways to, to, uh, spicing up and enliven food and dishes. And I was a part of uh, this, this thing just got inside of me and shake yourself awake was really about just an explosion of kind of a culinary awakening that I had. And I decided I wanted to come up with a formula that, that I could share it with, with folks. And that was the food part. I'm still crazy passionate and gusto actually stands for passion, but uh, behind closed doors, I was also, you know, working on, the brand itself, the name, the colors, the burst, um, how does the menu work? What's, what's an interior going to look like? What's a, how's a kitchen going to flow? All those things. So it's pretty ridiculous and audacious, even when I tell the stories at times, but I just truly set out to, to invent what I wanted as a consumer. 
I had a lot of help along the way, you know, God put the right people in my life at the right times, but it was also a relentless pursuit of, of something very unique and, and to, to create something out of thin air is pretty wild. Um, and we opened that first one in 2014 and to your point, point we are I've learned a ton and and it, it started with the food and then it became about the human beings we call teammates um and and now and now we have a chance to really change the game in terms of fast food as I mentioned our, our uh, we are opening a new spot on the corner of downtown um we're so excited to join the downtown community and and uh to to link arms with Georgia State um and then beyond that, we 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 have a drive-through model that that is really going to disrupt some things. So, sorry for going on and on, but that's that's uh, the the brief version. So that's great. The, um, so, 2014 is a long time ago, right? It Boy. seems like a long time ago, right? In the sense of like the way food has evolved and what we think about what food is like today and our, our you know. So, you know, when students think about you know these journeys, they take a while, right? takes a long time to develop a brand and develop a following and to, to, to think of those ideas and, and where you're going to be in 10 years. Can you talk a little bit about um, that journey and how, you know, how you see Gusto, how it, how it formed and how um, you see that change over that period of time from 2014 till today? And, um, you know, with all the competitors in the marketplace now that, that offer that healthy, healthy food. Yes, sir. I mean, we could talk for hours. I mean, like I said, it took me four or five years before I over opened the doors to the first restaurant to, to manifest this thing on paper and to raise my first $600,000, um, literally driving around in a minivan, like grilling chicken and, and hat in hand to raise money because I didn't have anything. Former NFL player. Yeah, but I was I was at the bottom of the barrel. So um from 2004, the, the first restaurant we ever opened, I'm pretty sure everybody was like, what is this? Oh, former football player, that, 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 that title always follows me. It felt like a pretty mature brand right out of the gate. So folks were like, is this out of California? Is this a franchise? What is this? But long story short, Ben, I've, it was the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. I, you know, blood, sweat, and tears. I slept in the parking lot in between lunch and dinner. I slept in the parking lot at night sometimes. Um, I'm a control freak and I had a hard time. You know, I was really nurturing this baby that I'd put my whole life into and other people's money. So <clears throat> I had fortunately operated other restaurants along the way. I worked at Chipotle, worked at Little Ozio's, worked at the General Mirror, worked at a sushi place called Maki Fresh. So I had trained myself and put myself through what I would call restaurant grad school. Um, by working in other people's restaurants. And uh, that's humbling, you know, that's, that, that requires tremendous patience and tremendous humility uh, to put yourself in. And I just, I was never, never really motivated by the money. The idea was always bigger and I want to build a brand that is unique and making a difference in our world. So but back to your original question, I mean, we, we launched October 31st, November 2000, or yeah, October 31st, 2014, across the street from Piedmont Hospital on the top of Peachtree. And again, that first six months, the hardest thing I've ever done. I've led people, but I've never, I've never had to write their payroll checks. I've never had to receive hundreds of invoices. I've never had to learn, you know, government regulations. I've never uh, had to deal with insurance. I, you know, just a, a million things coming at you at the same time. And um, so that was a wild experience. Open up a second gusto here on Ponce. Um, it's across the street from the Claremont Hotel. And that was the second one. And, and, and going from one to two was very hard for me because the amount of obsession that a lot of founders have with their thing uh, is hard to let go of. But I knew this was never going to be what it was meant to be unless I could let go. And what letting go means, Ben, is hiring the right people and training and developing each other as leaders um, and hiring the right people for me has always been not hiring yes people, but hiring people that have different viewpoints than me surrounding yourselves, you know, so that our differences make it stronger. And 
Man, oh, man, again, we could go on and on and on, but then we opened Decatur and West Midtown and then Ch and Chambly, and, and, and here we are. It's 2022. Never saw the pandemic coming. I felt like, you know, man, we don't deserve this. We already did the hard stuff, right? Let's just grow now, but that's just real life. And now we sit, um, I think we're about 300, 350 teammates. So, of course, growing a brand and a company and leading something that big, it's it's what the dream was. And sometimes I walk around going, am I, am I living in I, imposter syndrome? You know, like I'm, I'm living in a dream. This is what I, this is what I sketched and it's happening, but you know, as well as I do that, that that's through thousands of mistakes and problems and challenges and, and, and being tough enough to, to lean into them and figure out the answer. So, you know, your brand is at a current, like at a, a threshold right now, right? Where you're moving into, you know, the next phase of development. A lot of brands, you know, at that seven or eight or 10 units, it starts kind of wobbling because you're trying to develop, you know, your, your infrastructure, your management staff, the, the, you no. Know. So what kind of, what keeps you up at night when you think about moving the brand forward to that next stage? Um, where, you know, you've got to step back a little bit and um, not be the operator, but think strategically about the brand going forward? It's a good question. I mean, uh, what keeps me up is, is, am I a strong enough leader? Am I a smart enough leader? Am I making the right moves? Am I thinking about this a year in advance, two years out, three years out, five years out? Having never done it, those are probably reasonable doubts, right? But I will tell you, we have so much momentum and, and good mojo. That we have folks coming to us and want to be a part of this. So <clears throat> one of our biggest kind of values at Gusto is, is, is having a growth mindset. So I'm forever curious and hunting and studying on uh, how to get better. And, uh, you know, for the last two years, what's kept me up at night is the, the safety of our teammates. And the, and the safety of our guests, because it's been hard. And that's a whole nother conversation, right? Um, when, when our costs go up eight or 10%, we can't necessarily pass that straight along to the, to the customer. You know what I mean? Like we need to be charging $15 a bowl to make our nut, our margin. And we just can't do that because the mission is to sell better food to more people, you know? So pricing strategies are, are really hard right now. Supply chain pressures, the labor market pressures. We, 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 we could talk for a week, Ben, alone about, you know, what keeps me up at night right now. Because um, the last two years have had a big asterisk by it. But for me, from a leadership standpoint, is it's very simple. Uh, we, we do have to find good real estate. and We have to make sound decisions. But... Uh, it all boils down to the human beings for me. So leading with a servant's heart and, 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 and trying to lead from a place of empowerment and lifting others up, it just feels like a, a, a no brainer. And, and uh, uh, we're, we've, we've really gotten stronger culturally. I mean, our internal culture over the years, and we're about to revisit um, what we call values in action. Um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm going off a little bit of tangent, but I'll tell you what those values in action are. And I'll tell you what our purpose statement is. And this is eight years later, guys, you know, sometimes you could write, I've, by the way, I've written our business plan ah, about, a, about 200 times, you know, I wrote, I wrote it a bunch before we opened and then we opened and then you rewrite it every day. You rewrite it every week. It moves. It's it's fluid. It's hard. It's painful. Oh, I didn't add this addendum. I didn't. I never saw this coming. That business plan is constantly uh, adapting, or or you will die. You will get gobbled up. But I digress. Our purpose is to intentionally foster growth, and I'll say it again: to intentionally foster growth um, with our products. That's kind of like the discovery and try new things uh, with our human beings. I feel the responsibility to develop personally and professionally our, our teammates. We invest in ourselves, intentionally fostering growth in our places. We want to add values to our communities 
um, and not just be another another restaurant. I mean, we 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 truly want to add value to our communities by getting involved. Um, and then through our impacts, we want to be generous. We want to give to education. Um, we 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 want to. We want to offer travel. I think travel is the best way to learn. Uh, so we're going to use travel as an incentive for our teammates. Instead of giving them a hundred dollar bonus, you know, I, I would rather see them, you know, uh, hop on a plane and go to California. That, that 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 you can't understand others unless you 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 see others and you and you consider walking in other shoes. It's just it's hard to to hate folks when you see how other people live. So. I'm going all over the place, but back to our values in action. Uh, they are, we are Gusto, which is just that united front as we continue to grow a brand. Lead with grace. Um, you're going to feel that kind of servant's heart. Leading with grace is very counterculture these days. And it, that is a value in action that we held on to tightly through the pandemic. Um, easier said than done, obviously. Quality over quantity. We want to make thoughtful decisions. And everything we do, be a pro is one of the hard things you mentioned in the restaurant business. Uh, restaurant business is not known for necessarily being professional. And is one of the things that I couldn't believe when I got in the restaurant business, like lack of communication, lack of leadership, abuse, all, all this stuff. So you talk about a growth mindset. And I think that, you know, as, as GSU students, um, that's really important because, you know, a lot of our students... Um, you know, a lot of our students are first generation college students. A lot of them, you know, haven't had the many of the advantages that many college students have had. Uh, and that's one of the great things of working here at Georgia State. So, you know, and a lot of that growth mindset is learning from failure, understanding that failure is a part of that learning process. And that, you know, as long as you continue to think about how you can grow as an individual, can you talk a little bit about uh, a failure or something that you experienced during along your journey that, um, you know, was significant enough that made you question whether or not you were doing the right thing and how you how you how you address failure now in in your in your business uh yes sir um you know if i had to go do it over again i probably would have like found a partner or two i for whatever reason i felt like i had to do this myself and and that is a huge thing to take on so i would advise anybody if they're going to start a business or go down the path of entrepreneurialism or, or even franchising, it's, 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 it's easier and more fun to do it with others, even if it requires sharing some of the stake. Um, that's just my advice. Um, uh, I will say that one of the dangers of being an entrepreneur, it, it can be, it could also be very lonely then. It can be a, a very lonely path. I lost touch with friends family i still have folks that i've lost touch with because like what happened to nate i just disappear into a dark hole of obsession um but it, it 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 probably won't work unless that obsessive nature is not there you know combing it every day and unless you've done it it's just hard to describe but um it's it's very it's very easy to lose focus of balance been along along the way um you know, stop taking care of yourself, stop taking care of relationships, stop, stop taking care of, you know, the things that really matter. Um, and those are big picture things. Uh, we've made plenty of mistakes from the wrong menu items to charging, charging too little uh, to, you know, signing a business deal or a lease that you, that, that uh, you wish you would have added a provision to. Um, they're, they're <clears throat> how much time do you have? Uh, we've made hundreds of mistakes, but it's just a part of it. And that's generally where I get to, especially a younger generation, the amount of toughness and patience required to, to, for something to be sustainable is it's, 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 it's hard for somebody to hear that it takes two years to prove something, four years to prove something, eight years to prove something guys. But the amount of toughness, and it's easy to jump from job to job, or it's it's easy to be like, oh, I see this shiny object. Let me go do this, or you know, or this may, this sounds like a better opportunity. But the amount of toughness and patience required to to see something through, even when you're not sure, um, I, I, I never didn't believe in myself and the idea. 
So can you talk a little bit? And if students have questions, please put them in the chat or take your video off and you can ask a question, raise your hand. Um, can you talk a little bit about the, the name, Gusto? Like, was that the first iteration? Did you have other names you came up with before? Um, you know, we had the discussion prior, Gusto, Gusto. Um, and can you talk a little bit about uh, some of the challenges of branding something like a restaurant, finding a brand name that isn't there out there already? Um, yeah, it's hard. I, I, you know, again, you could go all over the place. When you start with a blank slate, it's pretty intimidating. You know, when you start with a whiteboard that has nothing on it, what, what do you do? Where do you go? Well, you start, you draw a straight line and you draw some curves and then you draw some circles and you say, is it green? Is it red? Is it orange? Is it, you know, um, what is this thing? What's the soul of it? And I was fortunate enough to cross paths with a brand designer named Lindsey Denman. And he and I, fell, I fell in love with the process of branding similar to I did with food. And um, I'll give you the short version. I mean, Yes, sir. It had a bunch of names. First name was called uh, The Alternative. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> um, because uh, I was just thinking, this is in 2010, guys, I didn't know anything about food other than what I ate, right? But The Alternative was, oh, I also called it Oxymoron, uh, Oxys, because healthy fast food, healthy fast food is Oxymoron. So it was called Oxys for a while. That's just horrific. Um, the, the one that stuck the most was, it was called Karmaco for quite some time. Um, and Karmaco, these flavor profiles were called Bursts. So I originally got the shape of the burst of our logo really from the BP logo. I was just inspired. If you, you think through the gas station, BP logo and, and the brightness of that, green those greens um and all this again came together through many many meetings and many many you know uh sessions um where you're beg borrowing and stealing people's time and expertise along the way because i didn't have anything and karmaco wasn't going to work because somebody pointed out to me that half of karma is 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 bad so um you, you don't ever want to set yourself up for anything bad and of course the, the flavor profile is called Gusto's now. We're called Bursts. It doesn't take a, a rocket scientist to figure out that Bursts may not be the best way, you know, best branding idea to call a flavor profile unless you're selling candy. Um, so then long story short, I, I was, it was raining one night. I was sitting <clears throat> at a computer and I had, uh, not surprisingly obsessively, you know, what's your base, what's your protein and what's your blank and i had about 30 of these colorful things on a piece of paper i knew i knew what the process was going to be and what these things were and they all had names like chipotle mango avocado like tzatziki lemon artichoke and they weren't those particular things they 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 they, they stayed in their lane in other words it was not fusion these were these were things that were uh, if you the chipotle mango avocado was was southwest tzatziki lemon artichoke was was greek so i had these colorful things and it was what's your base what's your protein and what's your flavor really was what i was trying to say and it just so happens that gusto and gusto are are synonymous with with, with the word flavor and, and passion and i knew i was going to have issues with the pronunciation of it but i was like uh, to hell with it. You know, there's too much power here and no, nobody is owning this other than a payroll company in California. Um, nobody is owning uh, gusto in this old kind of Americana word in the 40s, 50s or 60s where they say, live today with gusto sport. Yeah. Back to the Dale Carnegie quote, which is in some of our stores, Ben, just to wrap that up. Um, I think all around the world, they may say, you know, some folks say gusto, some may say gusto. On one hand, it, it kind of bends toward flavor. On the other hand, it bends toward passion. The, the quote that it was on my original investor pitch book uh, 10 years ago was by Dale Carnegie, a famous author that said, today is life, the only life you're sure of. Uh, get interested in something, shake yourself awake, let the winds of enthusiasm sweep through you, live today with gusto is the last line. And that was really my inspiration. Yo, could you stop it? going for the gusto, if you will. And that's where Shake Yourself Awake came from because 
uh, I, I, the culinary moment I had where I was like, I'm really going to chase this ridiculous dream and, and, and make it happen and will it to happen. Um, that, that, that was a moment I had in my own kitchen uh, over 10 years ago. That's great. I think the brand, I think it's a great, uh, a great brand in terms of the name. It's very, very, uh, thank you. Uh, memorable. It's easy to say. I mean, even though you say gusto, gusto, it doesn't really matter. Um, I think it's matter. really a challenge today in the marketplace to come up with something that, you know, represents your brand at the same time is, you know, people can pronounce and understand and it means something. So um, I agree. I'm with glad you. you didn't pick the um, oxymoron or the, what was the first one? The alternative, um, baby. Alternative. <laughs> Yeah, that would, I don't know if we'd be talking today if it was the alternative. <laughs> yeah, um, Brett, that's a good example of the, the iteration and the patience and the toughness and the constantly questioning, constantly questioning, constantly molding, constantly peeling, constantly, you know, it's just, it's, it's a process. Um, we have a question here. Uh, hold on, let me see on the chat. Uh, Many asked, were you solely focused on the business concept in the beginning? Did you have alternative plans? If so, did any of the alternatives hinder or help your business growth? So were you, while you were doing this, what were you, uh, what were you doing to keep yourself fed? And uh, did you, did you, were you working at the same time or how'd you while manage was, that? While I was developing the idea? Yeah. Yeah, it's a great question. I, I, uh, I worked in restaurants. I took recipes to real estate caravans. I, you know, you, when you're in the hustle mode, uh, and again, I, uh, I'm sorry, Matt. Sorry. I, I, I lost touch with friends, family. I was so obsessed on this singular point, but guys, I, I didn't care about money. So I'm, I'm, I, uh, I made, you know, eight, nine bucks an hour as an assistant manager at a sushi joint. And in the, in, in, in the meantime, I was a manager at this restaurant. I was a shift leader at this restaurant. So um, it was weird for some of my friends and family because I still look like a former football player. But to see a, a, a wet towel over my shoulder, you know, wiping down tables and cleaning toilets and sweeping, I just took tremendous pride in it. And it was truly like my graduate school. So um, it wasn't I wasn't ashamed of it. And I knew where I was headed and I knew what the output was going to be. And um, like I said, I drove a really busted minivan that only had one headlight. I can't believe in hindsight, I didn't get pulled over, but um, the, the, the ego was out the door. And, and I was basically, any of my friends or family would tell you, I was just getting by. And a lot of them were worried about me because I was so singularly focused on this invention. Um, but I had other jobs, several. So you have an, a really interesting uh, like life trajectory in terms of you know, spending all your energy, you know, to be a, to be a, a collegiate athlete at the highest level takes kind of ultimate focus, right? Where, you know, you focus on one thing and to, to be the best at that, right? And sometimes the detriment of the other things that you could have done. Um, so when you think about your life journey, what, is, what did that teach you and what did you miss out on when you, when you focused on that goal? Um, obviously, you can, you know, to be, to do that, you've been able to focus on one thing and, and perform at the highest level. Um, anything you regret or, or, or that you wish you had done when you were younger? Yeah. I mean, that, it's a good question. And now this is going to turn into a therapy session, Ben. Um, uh, damn you. We're going to go backwards. Um, you know, I, I think I'll wrap it back to something that I'm fond of. I was, 32, 33. I really didn't know who I was. And I think a lot of people fall into the same trap. Um, just going, going down life's past the, the tracks that are laid before you, uh, the, the expectations of your parents or your church or your friends or your, your girlfriend or whatever those things are. So shake yourself awake is also about, for me, I fell in love with, um, a program called the Enneagram and, and not to, go off on too big of a tangent, but it, it's all about self-awareness. So whether or not it's yoga or hypnotherapy, which I do, or, you know, I just encourage everybody to study themselves, like truly um, peel back the onion um, because you know, we only have one life. And as Dale Carnegie said, you know, live it with gusto and, and just don't wake up and be 35 or 40 
and go and, and don't have regrets and say, wow, I didn't, I didn't go for it. I didn't get after it. I, I was too scared. Um, so, you know, do I have regrets? I, I think everybody thinks about their past in different forms or fashion, but I will tell you if I hadn't played in front of a hundred thousand people on, on Saturdays or millions on TV, I probably would not. It probably prepared me for the toughness uh, of, of being a leader uh, with so many challenges. So I'm thankful for that. Um, I'm also thankful I wasn't an athlete in the day of social media because I'm not sure I'm tough enough to handle <laughs> handle that part nowadays. Um, but I, if I could give a strong piece of advice to any student out there, for me, it's the Enneagram. I'm a four, which is kind of the artist. And had I really nourished that part of my soul more early on, who knows where my life would have gone. I might have been a saxophonist, you know, and 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 not an entrepreneur. I might I might have been painting in New York City, but know thyself to me feels like the strongest uh, the strongest thing I can bring to that part of the conversation. Be honest with yourself. That's that's great advice. I think for a lot of students, you know, that discovery process that they have in college is something where they're searching, and we a lot of times yes. we want to say to students just, you know focus on something and do it when really, you know, it's a time for you to kind of explore uh, your different passions. Um, Brennan has a question, so he's going to unmute and, and ask the question. Go ahead, Brennan. Okay, thank you so much for talking with us today. I had a question about the GSU downtown specific location, uh, because I know that it's going to be opening upcoming this, this year, right? Uh, okay. uh, in, uh, in, in one month. In one month. Well, very excited for that. But a lot of my friends wanted me to ask you about a lot of the restaurants downtown, a lot of the food and beverage options and like the business district and like GSU campus close with the business hours of the local community. So like a lot of things close around like six. So there's not that many like late night food options for us students at our campus. Will, uh, will Gusto be staying open to like the normal hours, like the Ponce one at 10 or like the Pima one at nine? Beautiful question, Brennan, and right on topic. Thank you. Um, so we're studying it right now. We have not determined. I, I know we're staying open until at least eight or nine o'clock, um, and we're and we're going to be open on the weekends. So, you know, it's an interesting thing to to try to pop your flag down. We believe in downtown. You know, we're also up in Avalon, which is a you know pretty pretty ritzy, bougie uh, uh, brand up in Alpharetta. What a proud thing to say we if we if we can work in, in downtown and 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 serve these different communities. Uh, it's a pretty cool cross section. So we understand the challenges, you know, from safety to uh, parking. There's all kinds of challenges for downtown when you talk about that business plan. But if I if I read your question and your and your tone correctly, you guys are you guys are pardon the horrible pun, but I mean you're starving for better options or more options at different parts of the day. We are. That's why if you're staying open till eight, that would be a game changer. My friends and I, as well as like a lot of the GSU community, because there's not too many like healthy options on campus that are open late, besides the dining halls. So. Yes, sir. I mean, when I was, when we got the opportunity, uh, I told our team, I've been a fan of downtown for a long time in terms of being a part of change and um, the, it, it, it's, it's the restaurant scene down there, no offense to anybody, it's, it's never felt crazy safe. It's never felt crazy clean. Um, so we just felt like we had an opportunity. I told my team to go, let's go Let's go create an oasis on the corner where people feel safe and it's and our bathrooms are the are the best in downtown and they can get a, a, a great bowl of wrap. Um, and you're not the first person to ask us about operating hours, but I'll tell you, it's been hard because the last two years in COVID, it's parts of the year, it's like a ghost town down there, right? Um, but is your advice to me? If, if we build it, they will come. If, if we're open, uh, will, will, will we have enough business to, to sustain at night? I'll bring my friends. That's what okay. I can say. But I do know that during the summer, it is it is very barren downtown yeah. on the campus. Well, I'll, this is a good time to talk about a, a building a business plan because this is different than any other business plan. We have to plan for cash flow problems around July 4th in the middle of the summer. 
and we have to plan for cash flow problems around Christmas as you guys take breaks and you're gone. Um, so we have to have a strong day part uh, business. Folks are starving for, for dinner options down there. We have a strong catering uh, team and delivery obviously has really come a long way. Let me flip the script. Brandon, how does everybody move around down there? And, and do you guys frequently order from delivery services or would you rather visit a, a location? Well, I just ordered from one of your competitors, but I'm going to Augusta for dinner tonight. Um, but I just got Chipotle for lunch, ordered it. But I also like going in person and like having big tables so like we can study and like have like a place like to, to hang out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we'll spend more money and buy those brownies and buy that green drink that you have. Right, right. Which which Chipotle did you order from? The one on Ponds. Sorry. Yeah. No, it's fine. <laughs> I was actually, uh, so I walked in that store, Ben, back to the story. I walked in there and said, I want a job. And they, they put me doing the dishes for months. And then I made my way up to grill master at that particular store at that store. And now I have a gusto, you know, three, three, three doors down, but, um, I, we could, we could go on and on and on. I certainly appreciate the conversation, but I would tell you that we are right now planning to stay open until eight or 9 PM um uh seven days a week and then we're going to kind of go with the flow and, and see what happens we're hoping that if if we can spurn some some new momentum down there maybe we can get some other businesses interested in coming down there and joining us and then there is a synergistic new kind of momentum uh, for downtown so um we have a couple of uh, a couple of questions um from students um so one question is uh kind of what is what are your what is your daily routine like what kind of what does your day look like in terms of uh, as a as a, a founder what do you do on a daily routine and um what motivates you on a daily basis so i have a pretty wild schedule and my gal and i just had a baby a little isaiah so that that, that really changed some things up um uh personally um but my schedule nick will tell you um uh, I'm up at six six thirty in the morning, and and some days work until seven eight p.m. Um, the freedom is awesome, um, so there is a reward at the at the end of the tunnel, if you know, with some freedom uh, on the entrepreneurial side. Um, I spend part of my time at our we work here on the Beltline. I'm looking at a couple of our leaders right now. What's up, fellas? Um, I also I love being in the restaurants. I love being in the shops. Um, in fact, I miss it. So that's been one of the, the, the challenges for me has been now I am coming to an office almost every day. One of the things I told you I didn't want <laughs> early on, uh, but um, there's a different type of discipline. When I knew what the goal was, which was show up at the restaurant all day, every day and, and, and turn out great product and, and, and try to build teammates, um, I knew what the goal was. Now working on the next 10 real estate decisions and raising money and and uh, thinking big picture and, and trying to join part of the disrupting a fast food conversation. The, it's exciting. It's 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 also at times intimidating. And uh, um, my motivation, I think, comes from, you know, having a chip on our shoulder at building something from scratch being lo on a local Atlanta brand, being very proud of that. And, and honestly, Ben, like there's, I wrote this in a release the other day. I mean, there's, there's never been a, a healthy fast food. There are bowl places and there, there are uh, sandwich places and there are salad places, but our goal is going to end up being to disrupt fast food with a drive-through model. Downtown won't have it obviously. And we're going down there for different reasons, but we have pretty bold plans of, of, of being a brand that's going to be around for a long time. Great. Uh, we got a couple of questions. Uh, one is about um, the organizational structure that you have. Uh, we had talked briefly in the beginning about um, franchising and about uh, Chick-fil-A and about their model. Can you talk a little bit about uh, your, your organizational model? How do you motivate uh, individuals at the outlet level? And um, how do you make them engage kind of the community? So 
the men and women who run our restaurants are called local operating partners. <clears throat> uh, and a guy named Chris is going to be a local operating partner for downtown. So I hope you guys get a moment to meet him. Um, good example of a former guy who's tried to make it in the restaurant business and, and tried to do it himself. And it was just, it was hard and, and uh, he struggled with it. So he's joining our brand. We don't charge a fee. So there is, there is no investment. And following in the footsteps of Chick-fil-A, these guys are motivated by salary, plus they profit share with us. So, you know, I'm letting you under the hood just a little bit, but um, they are, you know, local operating partners get their picture and their name. And all this goes on the front door. And as you and I talked about, there's a lot of ways to structure franchising, non-franchising partnerships, limited partnerships, yada, yada, a lot of legal terms, but uh, the way it's set up is is modeled after we want them to win, and and we if they win, then we win as you know as a brand, and uh, that <clears throat> that win win relationship asterisks with the pandemic makes everything harder. But that win win relationship in in quote unquote normal times, uh, we believe in that, and it is our capital. So the franchising model, uh, I've the ones that I've studied, you know, the the, the soul and the and uh, can can get watered down if you go out and sell a bunch of franchises, in particular in the restaurant business. So we're growing organically, and what that means is with our capital, with our people, with our employees. But a local operating partner is the champion of of his or her store, and part of their job is to literally get in the community and host spirit nights, host fundraising, sponsor Little League Baseball, all those things uh, that I feel like 20 years ago I saw posted on the wall of an Applebee's down in South Georgia. But, you know, we're trying we're trying to live it. We want, we want to be active parts of our community. So we have a couple of questions about uh, growth. One, um, this, the two related questions. So first one is like, how do you how do you find the locations that you uh, are looking to grow into? And the second one is, are are you going to move anywhere south side of Atlanta, Jonesboro, McDonough, Stockbridge? Um, you know, given that you know, uh, you know, a lot of these locations that um, are outside of the city or or that don't have many of those food options are usually the the kind of least desirable in terms of building a, a restaurant, right? So. Um, in some locations where there's lots of fast food or traditional fast food, um, you know, the, the price point, for example, you talked about is something that really prevents people from engaging uh, with, with, the, with healthy food. Um, because the whole model supports kind of low food cost uh, and low food cost items tend to, you know, not be as, as healthy or nutritious many times. Yep, you're right on. And I, I don't get on this soapbox a lot, but yeah, low, low food cost items typically use preservatives. They're, they're a reason why they can like give you as much food as they can for $4.99, you know, and that turns into a lot bigger conversation about, you know, some of the problems we have in this country um, on how we eat. And I'm certainly not perfect and, and neither is our menu, you know, but um, we are a, a gateway and, and, a, and a stepping stone into a healthier way of eating. Um, yeah, I would say from a growth model standpoint, it was, you know, it's as simple as pulling up a map and, and, and trying to understand, uh, first of all, who's your customer got to know that. And second of all is where are they and how do they move and how do they, you know, how are they going to access your, your spot? Um, we, again, we're very proud of this downtown location. I don't think a lot of people saw it coming like, oh, okay, we're here. Here's another brand. Now head to the suburbs and go go make your money. And that's just not what we're doing. We we want to be local and 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 we want Atlanta to be proud of of this you know brand. So um, we uh, later this year. So we open downtown in about a month, and we open in Athens. If anybody's familiar with Athens, hour down the street, home of the Bulldogs. We open in Athens in about two months. And then we're going to this fall open in, in Tucker, which is 
as you talk about, I would say a little bit more of a blue collar community that, that is on the rise and, and looking for better options. We're going to open in, in Buford across the street from the Mall of Georgia, heavy traffic area. And then we are looking in Peachtree City, Madonna, um, Fayetteville. I'm, I'm, I'm not a pro at, at, at understanding all the real estate nuances, but it always starts with who's your customer and, uh, and, and, and then where are they? And I will tell you guys that if, if you ever sign a lease, I mean, these things are 80, 90, 100 pages and, and you got to sign your name on it <laughs> and, and you're, you're stuck to it, you know, usually five or 10 years. And that's a huge obligation. So um, we're going to we're not selling franchises and we're going to continue to grow in and around Atlanta and Georgia. But then my ultimate dream, man, like I said, with Carmico and the alternative and all that ridiculous stuff at the beginning, <laughs> Um, one of my inspirations was driving up, driving up from South Georgia to Atlanta when I was young was, you know, that uh, those interstate exits off I-75, they always had the same five fast food restaurants. So I don't know if and when we get there, but we would like to become an, an alternative. And here we are, come full circle. We would like to be an alternative to those fast food restaurants. Um, but we have to be smart because the, the economics have to make sense. Not sure I answered the question fully, but so uh, we have a question about uh, supply chain and when you and how you think about your supply chain, uh, given that you know um, that's a, a really difficult thing today to to kind of think strategically about your uh, supply chain with the, with the pandemic as well as kind of sourcing materials. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you how you approach that? Uh, I'm not an expert at it. I'm happy to talk about it. I mean. I think as a country, we were, from my perspective, we were pretty spoiled. Looking back now, pre-pandemic, you know, everything just kind of showed up at our doorstep or we didn't have to worry about inflation. And the pandemic just uncovered all, all these uh, ripples and bottlenecks and, and challenges. And um, the, the, the short story is we, we hired a supply chain specialist to come in and really help us renegotiate contracts and, and put pressure on our vendors. I will tell you this, you know, when you have one restaurant, you have no leverage, you have, you, you can't, you can't push back on anything. You have to just take it. And, and you have 10 locations, you have a little bit of leverage and you have 20 Chipotle, 2,500 locations. They got a ton of leverage. You know, they, 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 they figure out ways to hedge, you know, rising chicken prices. They figure out ways to hedge, their, their salsa making. Um, growing a company is a unique thing. So it's just small win here and there, small win here and there as we get, you know, kind of footholds, uh, the, the, the bigger we get. Um, but I can straight up answer the question, you know, our, our cost of goods sold, which for a restaurant is, is a big controllable cost. You know, it, 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 it rose a year and a half, two years ago. It, it's steady rose up to 6% higher, 8% higher, 10% higher. All of a sudden your profit margins, that six, eight, 10% with your profit margins. So I'll just tell you that breaking even the last two years in the restaurant business has been winning. And that's a damn tough pill to swallow for everybody. Um, well, what are you going to do? You know, just stop, stop getting it, stop showing up to work. Uh, Cause we believe in the future of the brand, but I have a lot of empathy and and um, yeah, like true true tears for the restaurant business and the service business because not only has it been hard to communicate and serve and, and connect with human beings behind masks and 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 safety's been a, a question mark, but the the sales and the profit margins like it's just not attractive. Um, and I think a lot of folks were sitting on their hands during the first wave of the pandemic, inventing ideas and couldn't wait to get out there and put their ideas out there. And they do that to a market that has ridiculously high cost of goods sold and a, and a labor market that stretched thin. So, man, it is really you, you feast your fam. You know, just kind of it, it is so aggressive and 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 savage out there right now. And uh, I can just say this: looking back, I'm glad we're going to be a $25 million company at the end of this year. I'm glad we're at the spot where we're at, where we have enough momentum and trust built up uh, to, to endure. Yeah. I think, you know, you, it's a 
really challenging time for restaurants, right? For the independent operators, uh, smaller operators, um, because the American consumer on average spends less on their, of their income on food than pretty much anywhere else in the world, right? Because we, we, we tend to like big portions and um, you know, cheap prices. So um, that's putting a lot of pressure us, on, on us in the restaurant business. Um, when you think about Chipotle and you think about, you know, I, to be honest with you, in the last experience I've had with Chipotle, they haven't been great. Um, the, the food hasn't been great. The service has been pretty terrible. Um, and, you know, that's a huge, that's a huge publicly traded company that basically um, has resources, right? So how do you, you know, that's why companies are looking at robotics, figuring out a way to cut costs, trying to figure out how to like continually, you know, innovate in order to um, succeed in this marketplace, right? Because in order to succeed, you're either going to raise prices or you're going to lower costs, right? What are so? What are some of the things that you, innovations that you're thinking about going forward to continually to innovate as you go forward? It's a million dollar question, a billion trillion dollar question. You know, in the restaurant business, these guys are trying to figure this out. Um, again, I'll go back to just taking care of human beings. I mean, we, we serve food through our human beings. So from health benefits to um, we PTO has now trickled down from whole, from, from our corporate team all the way down to the restaurant level. I've never heard of PTO in the restaurant business. <laughs> um, so more and more benefits. Um, I think the design and the, and having a happy place that has a lot of sunlight um, and big windows um, and, you know, forgive my French, but I mean, you just need people to give a shit. You, you need people who care. Um, and uh, that's hard. It's, it's very hard. There's a reason why it isn't done well. I think Chick-fil-A is a global leader in how they treat their human beings. And that, that momentum flows through to their customer experience. So that's not rocket science. It's just intention. And it's, it, 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 maybe it takes two, three, four points away from profit margins and puts it back into your human beings. But um, if, you can, if you can slow down turnover and, 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 you know, we have folks that have been with us for six, seven years since the beginning. I'm so proud of that because this business is so hard. I think taking care of human beings is a number one from a business standpoint. Uh, breakfast may be on the horizon for us, and that's a that's a that's a whole nother conversation that's really not public. <laughs> but we're gonna we're we're, we're actually gonna beta bre uh, call it beta brekkie uh, this fall downtown only. So the downtown location we're gonna deliver a better for you breakfast solution hopefully this fall, and that hopefully will tuck right into our drive through model as we continue to grow um, that way. Awesome. We have a few minutes left. I just wanted to uh, give you a chance to uh, talk any, about how would you want to engage students in in the downtown outlet? Are you looking for um, employees? Are you thinking about uh, opportunities to engage students in, in kind of a management training type opportunity? Um, obviously, you moving downtown gives you an opportunity to engage with um, many of our students, be it hospitality students or, or entrepreneurship students. So. Um, what are your what are your plans and, and how should students engage with you uh, going forward? <clears throat> Nick, I don't know if you want to jump in here as well. I don't know how this thing works, but I would say, I mean, first of all, we want to serve our community. You know, and this is a new community, so we want to take care and, and foster these relationships and serve you guys delicious bowls and wraps. Um, you know, we're, we're uh, I'll take the moment to say from a business plan standpoint, we, we, we're not a discount brand. So we, we, we have, we're careful about how we uh, build out, you know, discount plans and, and what that looks like, because that's usually the first question. Um, we want to be a place where Georgia State students are hanging out and they feel safe and they, and they feel good and they feel alive and, and they feel confident when, when they're at Gusto downtown. Um, it's a place where they can raise money with their causes with us, you know, um, let's, let's have get togethers. Let's have spirit nights. Let's, let's, let's host events. Let's, you know, have meetups at, at our spot. I can tell you it'll be a handsome place with a lot of natural light and, and a bustling place. Um, we have a promotion on our windows down there that has a QR code 
Um, Nick Tapp is on here as our director of marketing. It has a direct link to our, uh, our hiring portal. Um, as well as if you take a photo and follow us on Instagram, you can win Gusto for a year. Um, but that stuff is on the unit itself. Um, ultimately, we're, we're going to go after things like new age things, been like the NIL name, image, and likeness of some of you guys as athletes as we, as we try to help get them to help us grow our Instagram follower. We could go on and on about the business plan for downtown, but ultimately we we want to serve everybody good food in a safe, happening environment, and we, we want to be a, a good neighbor. And uh, when it comes to, we are absolutely hiring, and we will absolutely take care of you. And 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 we're looking for bright-eyed, bushy-tailed teammates. Um, we're going to open in a month, and we are in the middle of training already. The folks who have already joined us are training at some of our other stores. Nick, you want to speak to that hiring link or anything? Yeah, I mean, if you guys you guys are down there, and hi everyone, Nick, uh, director of marketing with Nate. I know we look very similar, especially when we're wearing our hats, but uh, you know this is what we're working with. But um, yeah, if you guys you guys uh, cruise by the shop, you know we're it's under construction right now, but there's a QR code that'll take you directly to our hiring portal uh, on Indeed.com. Um, Brennan, swing by, take your picture in front of the emphasize yourself. You know, chance to win free gusto for a year. Uh, we want to make sure that that um, we get involved and ingrained with the uh, the student society down there. Uh, we definitely. I used to work downtown, so I worked at a, a, a place called Creative Loafing for a few years, and it was it's really a, a dark. You know, it's a you're on an island, a food island is what we called it. There was not a lot of stuff, so um, we want to come down there and plant our flag and and give you guys a healthy fun cool option uh, to, to eat, get some good energy before classes. But um, we're always hiring. If you don't live down near Georgia State, we have, you know, eight other locations that's, that's hiring, um, especially right now. I'm sure you guys are all aware that staffing shortages are, are a real thing. But um, yes, we'd love to work with student organizations. If you guys have um, any organizations you're part of, uh, a big part of what we do in our communities, we like to give back by Spirit Nights, which is basically just fundraising events. So we partner with your organization and you guys promote uh, promote the night and the date and the time and come in and we give you guys donations. We give you 10% of sales uh, straight back to you. So it's a cool way for us to- uh, can, can to I, traffic. What's that? Oh, sorry to interrupt. I was just gonna throw it back on anybody who's attending. What have restaurants downtown done well and not done well um, with anybody's experience? Um, I actually have a lot of things I want to throw in there, but I think it's going to take longer than a, than a two minute conversation. Um, but you can email me I, anytime. My, my, I'll drop my uh, email address in the uh, chat box here and we're happy. I really that's, appreciate that. Yeah, yeah for sure. I have we... a lot of things I want to throw in there, um, comments, potentials, um, things that I see. Uh, but again, that's for a longer conversation. I don't know if everybody else on this Zoom call is willing to stay on like that. Um, but for sure, I would love to contact you guys, get in touch. Sure. Um, there's a lot, of, a lot of talks I'd love to throw in with you guys. Awesome. And we didn't introduce them yet, but Sarah and Megan uh, here on the call from our PR team. So, um, you know, we are we work as a team together to come up with creative ideas and ways to uh, integrate further into the community and, and the, the people that we serve in our communities, as well as our team members. So um, our, our brand promise is to intentionally foster growth. That's not just with, uh, with our guests and our customers, but also our team members in the communities that we're in. Awesome. Well, thank, thank you so much, Nate, Nick. It's been a great talk. I'm so excited for you guys to be downtown and to be used to, for, for us to, show you around Georgia State's campus. Um, we're on the up and up and downtown's on the up and up. And um, I'm truly excited about uh, partnering with you in the future. So thanks so much for coming today and look forward to seeing you in person sooner rather than later. We're, we're honored. Thank you very thank you. much. Perla, I look forward to meeting you at some point. We want to, I mean, we want to get better faster. Why not leverage you guys' data and your history and any of your talking points down there? So. Um, thank you so much. 
Let me add everyone before everyone jumps off. Hello, my name is Denise Griffin and I'm with Entrepreneurship and Innovation Institute. Thank you guys for joining us today. I wanna to thank Nate as well as his team. And of course, thank Ben for participating. If you'd like to see what other events Entrepreneurship and Innovation Institute offers, please visit our link. And I put our um, URL in the chat. It's eni.gsu.edu forward slash events. There you can get all of our information on up and coming events. And thank you again for joining us today. Have a good one.